considers procedures for the Farm Bill. House and Senate negotiators announced an agreement on the measure last week, and it's expected to pass the Senate by a wide margin. The outcome in the House is less certain, and the bill faces the threat of a veto from the president. This meeting of the Rules Committee is 90 minutes. Rules Committee will please come to order. We are here today to consider the conference report on H.R. 2419, the Farm, Nutrition, and Bioenergy Act of 2007. I'm happy yeah, that 2007 is an important piece. Uh, yes. Madam Chair, uh, you know, this second time has happened to me today. That's not the name of the bill. The name of the bill is the Food Conservation and Energy Act. This is, I don't know who keeps... Oh. My note says, here says the Food Conservation Energy Act. Right, that's what yeah, Okay. The but, title under which it passed... The minority, they don't give it to you. Well... Mr. Yeah, Peterson, well, I, Pat, I just, uh, I, when, I had, uh, when I filed the bill, somebody had put the wrong title on it. I just want to make clear. Well, that. but one important point is that this bill passed the House and the Senate in 2007. And it passed the House under the name of Nutrition Farm, Nutrition and Bioenergy Act of 2007. And that, that's, uh, that's what we are following. Happy to welcome the Chairman of the Committee on Agriculture, Mr. Peterson. And the ranking member of the Subcommittee on Horticulture and Organic Agriculture, Mr. Nuka Bauer. Uh, thank you both for the very hard work I know you've put in on this conference report. Uh, without objection, your full statements will appear in the record, and we welcome your summary. Mr. Peterson. Thank you, Madam Chair, and um, uh, we appreciate being here finally after this long ordeal. Mm -hmm. And uh, we A would... year later, so to speak. I've <laughs> been ready for a while. Yeah. Uh, but uh, we finally have been able to produce a conference report that has bipartisan support in both the House and the Senate. Uh, it um, includes $10 billion of new spending over and above the baseline. Um, uh, the baseline itself was $58 billion below what it was in 2002 for the commodity title. So. We started off in the hole. We added $10 billion to this bill over, over the baseline, the reduced baseline. And of that $10 billion, $10.3 billion went to nutrition. So all of the new money uh, in this bill, you could say, went into improving food stamps, uh, $1.25 billion for uh, food banks, and um, uh, one point. Zero five billion for a new snack program for the schools, uh, for fresh fruit and vegetables for low-income kids in, in low-income schools. So at a time when uh, food prices are a concern, not only uh, around the world but in the United States, uh, we have recognized that and have put substantial new money into the nutrition area. In addition, we have put uh, $4 billion into conservation, uh, which is actually $6.5 billion because we reduce the conservation reserve program by two and a half billion and spent that money on wetland reserve and uh, conservation security program and so forth. So there's some internal shifts within that. We have $1.3 billion of new increased funding for organic agriculture, fruit and vegetable programs, and local food networks. Um, and there's about a billion dollars in here for a new energy title, which is something that we haven't had before, that uh, puts uh, money into a loan guarantee program for cellulosic ethanol plants, uh, some smaller plants, and some larger plants, so we can have commercialization of cellulosic ethanol. We also set up a bioenergy program, uh, which allows us to start growing the feedstocks on a commercial scale with real farmers for these cellulosic ethanol plants, and that's frankly the biggest challenge we have in this area is we don't know how to grow switchgrass. We don't know how to get the woody biomass out of the woods in an efficient way. And we've got equipment to build, we've got to learn how to grow this, how to store it, how to move it, how to keep it dry. There's just a lot of issues, and so we've set up a five-year program to have farmers where they've got an ability to move this feedstock into an existing facility to grow these as crops to learn how to do it. Um, <clears throat> so the increased money in um, conservation and in fruits and vegetables and energy actually came out of the commodity title. 
So in addition to $58 billion coming out of there just through the regular process, we actually took money out of, more money out of that title and shifted it over into these other areas. So these editorial writers and folks that you read, some of them I've seen have said that the, they've, they've actually said in their editorials that the whole $300 billion goes to farmers. <clears throat> The truth is, you add up the commodity title, it's about 9%, and you add the disaster and crop insurance to it, 16% uh, of this bill goes to farmers. 73.5% uh, goes to nutrition. About 10% to conservation. So this is a much different bill than we've seen in the past. It addresses the needs and the wants and concerns of the American citizens. And, uh, you know, uh, all of these uh, editorial writers and other folks that have ginned up this reform issue, including the administration, um, have, you know, in a way really caused us a lot of problems because <clears throat> they've uh, manufactured an issue that I don't think really is an issue, and they kept us from actually doing more reform that should have been done uh, because everybody was focused on the wrong things. But having uh, said that, we did put a hard cap on farmers, uh, $750,000 of farm income where you will lose your direct payments after that amount, and $500,000 on non-farm income. So there will be a substantial amount of farmers uh, and non-farmers knocked out of the program. We intend, we also tried to put those limits on conservation. Uh, and it's kind of ironic or, well, I'll, I'll be kind. Uh, the groups that were pushing the payment limits uh, a lot of these groups that were involved in this, when they found out we were going to apply the same limits to conservation, all of a sudden I had a revolt. And so we had to back off. And so we actually have a million dollar limit on non-farm income on conservation and no limit on farmers. Uh, <laughs> which, uh, given what I have discovered has been going on in the conservation area, yes. I think is a real mistake because there's more abuses in the conservation area by far, than there is in the commodity title of this bill. And I will be having hearings and pointing this out in the near future. Um, so we've made uh, movements in that direction, not as good as some people wanted. Uh, it's a lot farther than anybody thought we'd ever get. Uh, Bob Goodlatte and I would have gone lower in the House, but the Senate, especially the Republicans, would not go beyond this number. And uh, I guess the thing that bothers me about this whole thing is that we have all kinds of other government programs going out to people that are not in agriculture. We don't have AGI limits on those programs. And it defies me to understand why one group of people should be singled out for an AGI limit when we make millions and sometimes billions of dollars of payments to some of these other businesses and corporations and nobody talks about putting AGI in them. But Having said that, uh, that's something that people want, and so we did include it in the bill. So we we have a good bill. It's a uh, bipartisan bill. Uh, uh, we filed it this afternoon at 2 o'clock. Uh, I think we hope to take it up tomorrow on the floor, and uh, we'd appreciate your uh, consideration of giving us a, a good rule and uh, Thank appreciate you. your patience. Yes, indeed, Mr. Nogabauer. Well, Chairman, uh, Woman Slaughter, Ranking Member Dreyer, and other members of the House Rules Committee, thank you for allowing me to be here today. I'm um, here uh, this afternoon to voice my support uh, for the Food Conservation and Energy Act of 2008 uh, conference report that the House and Senate conferees, of which I was uh, had the honor of being, uh, have compiled over the past few months. Uh, Madam Chairwoman, the road uh, to uh, coming to this conference uh, report and to this bipartisan bill was not an easy road. Uh, as many of you know, it's a long, been a long journey. Uh, it's seen its uh, share of obstacles and bumps and, uh, and along the way, but I'm proud to say that uh, this uh, uh, conference uh, report uh, has uh, the support of, of a majority of the conferees, uh, and uh, we believe that uh, this is a, a, a good bill uh, to bring to the floor. Uh, last summer, the House, as you know, uh, passed a farm bill without the support of the majority of the Republican members because it contained some tax increases in it. And that was the first time in the history uh, of the Farm Bill that uh, we'd ever had a Farm Bill that had uh, tax increases in it. And so as a result of that, myself and other colleagues uh, did not support that bill. Uh, 
because the House Farm Bill, as the chairman uh, pointed out, did have additional spending above the baseline, uh, at that particular time it exceeded it by, I think, about $13.7 billion over 10 years. It was ne necessary to go outside the House Agriculture Committee's uh, jurisdiction uh, to figure out how we were going to offset uh, the spending. Unfortunately, uh, when those offsets uh, came back, uh, they were uh, considered to be tax increases. And as, so, as I said, uh, a number of my colleagues and myself decided not to uh, support uh, that farm bill. But the bill we bring before you today, uh, will, uh, the floor this week, is a dramatically different bill than the bill that we passed uh, in the House. It contains more reform than any other previous farm bill, and it is 100 percent PAYGO compliant. Uh, it uh, physically responsible. It's actually uh, scoring about $4 billion less than the, the House passed version uh, and maintains a safety net necessary to ensure all American uh, families will continue to enjoy the benefits of affordable, safe, and plentiful food supply. Madam Chairman, since the conference report began, they're working to negotiate the differences between the House and Senate beginning in uh, January, and there have been some difficult times uh, through uh, that process. In fact, Quite honestly, there were times I didn't think we were going to be able to get this farm bill done. Uh, it seemed like uh, when we opened up this funding process, the, uh, the number of requests uh, for additional funding started pouring in because when people thought there was going to be a supply of new money, obviously there was a supply of new requests mm -hmm. for funding uh, that they, a lot of felt, folks felt like should be a part of the farm bill. Uh, and I'll tell you what, quite honestly, I'm confident we would not be here today with this bill had it not been for the persistence in the work of Chairman Peterson. And so I, I give him a, a great uh, 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 applaud for his tireless work on this. Uh, back times when we just didn't look like we were going to be able to get there, he kept plowing and kept plowing, to use a, a farm term. And you know, if you plow long enough, you finally finish plowing. And I'm pl proud to say that because of the, a, a bipartisan effort, uh, with the, the leadership of Mr. Peterson and Mr. Goodlatte, uh, we were able to come to the conference table, and we had, uh, you know, a good conference. Uh, obviously, there was a lot of competing interests, and those competing interests uh, followed us to that conference uh, process. Uh, but uh, we uh, were able to work through that, and we now have a bill that will be good for American agriculture. And I would have to say to you that it's important that America have a strong agricultural economy. Uh, one of the things we were debating on the floor or were earlier today uh, was talking about energy. And we've seen what uh, not having an energy policy in this country has led when we look at the cost of gasoline and oil today. And we certainly don't want to see a time in America where we have to wake up and uh, do the same thing with uh, food and the clothing that we do with energy and try to figure out who's going to sell us enough energy uh, today to run our economy and to run our nation. And so this farm bill provides an important safety net uh, for our producers of, of uh, agriculture. Uh, and it's timely. And uh, I would just say that uh, uh, we need to do this now sooner rather than later. Uh, we have producers uh, all across America that today that uh, are farming uh, without a farm bill. The, the extensions that this uh, body has passed uh, did not apply to the commodity programs. And so we have producers that on the faith that the Congress would do the right thing have gone out and planted crops in South Texas. Uh, and in uh, my congressional district, I'm going to be planting in the next few days. We have wheat farmers. The wheat's almost about ready to harvest. Uh, so it is important that we get this important legislation uh, to the House uh, floor as soon as possible. And we need to get uh, it passed in the House and Senate and uh, to the President's desk. And so I thank you for the consideration of this bill, and I would urge uh, the Rules Committee to uh, look favorably upon it. Well, thank you very much, Madam, Mr. Madam Chair. Uh, yes. I just am handing out uh, these charts. I'd like to call attention. You want those right. in the record? Uh, if I could. And, uh, Sorry, without objection. The first chart here shows the increases and decreases that are in the bill. Uh, as I said, 10.3 for nutrition. For so you can see, nutrition got the major part. Uh, commodities are down. And so forth. And then we also have a chart that shows the comparison from last bill to this bill. Uh, the yellow line is last bill, the whatever color, purple, I guess, is whatever that is, uh, is this bill. And so you can see nutrition is up and the commodities are down. It's the same story. And then we also did a pie chart to show uh, how much of the bill spending is going to the different areas. 
So uh, some graphic information to kind of tell the story that uh, Randy and I have told you today. So thank you for your consideration. Well, thank you both. And again, let me thank you for the hard work you've put in. There were times we were really worried about Colin. We thought we were going to have to send him away for a weekend or something to try to... He may still. Yeah. <laughs> but I know that this has been a heavy lift, and we're very grateful. Most people don't ever think about the state of New York that have the largest business in New York is agriculture. Uh, but I sure know it up where I live. And uh, the one regret I guess I have is we weren't able to do anything about the farm workers, the ag jobs. Uh, but I'm so happy about the specialty crops and I'm glad about the nutrition. You've done some wonderful work. Uh, just one question for me, and that is uh, I've been very much impressed with what I've heard about the conservation program and the problems that you've got there. Uh, is there a possibility of a standalone bill or something this year that we can do something to try to straighten that out? On the what? On the conservation programs. Uh, well, uh, we have uh, increased, you know, the conservation programs. And but you were saying that they had a lot of trouble. Oh, oh well. I'm talking about the difficulty okay. in that program. Well, uh, we'll see what comes out of the hearings. Okay. Um, what I was alluding to is um, we have had some very wealthy people that have bought uh, land and basically had the government pay for it. Uh, we've had st state subdivisions that have uh, one of them got $19 million um, out of one program. Uh, we stopped that in this bill. In Good. this bill, the state and, and uh, subdivisions of states will no, no longer qualify. Uh, but there's some real questions in my mind about what we're doing with some of these programs. And frankly, uh, I'm not sure if it's the administration or uh, whether there's flaws in the law, but um, uh, I intend to have some hearings on this. I think it was a mistake not to have the same payment limits on these conservation programs as we had on, on the others. If, if they're a good thing for farmers, they're good for that. So I intend to have a, a series of hearings to point out what's been going on, and there could well be something that would come out of that. Uh, we, we will see. Uh, but I think we fixed some of that in the bill good. already. Good. Uh, the question is, can we build public support to go further? I, I, I couldn't build it beyond what we have in the bill and we'll see what comes out of the hearing. So. Mr. Nogabauer, you agree? Yes, you know, I, I think we, we have to bring heavy equity in policy. I've been one all along that says, you know, that uh, uh, we, we Congress shouldn't pick winners and losers. And so exactly. if, we, you know, if we're going to, uh, in fact, put some restrictions on these programs, I, I don't think we want to encourage people to move one direction or the other. And so I think sometimes having arbitrarily different uh, payment limits or different programs for different categories of people is not necessarily, I think, a good policy. And I look forward to uh, working with the chairman and, and making sure that uh, uh, conservation is an important piece uh, of right. farm policy. But, but we, have to, right. we have to be careful here because uh, uh, one of the things we do know is that demand for agricultural products is increasing. Uh, and so we don't want to cause a, a disincentive uh, for people to uh, move from con conservation or production or back and forth and so I look forward to working with the chairman on that. And I'm glad this statement is already on the record that CBO has scored this and it is absolutely pay-go compliant. Thank you both very much. Mr. McGovern. Uh, thank you. First let me thank you both for your bipartisan work. Uh, and I appreciate your testimony. I should tell you that from from my perspective, uh, you know, this is an imperfect bill. But I suppose if it was a perfect bill from my perspective, then we probably couldn't get past the House or the Senate. So, um, couldn't get out of this committee. Could probably get out of this committee. <laughs> uh, I, mean, I, I wish there was more reform. Uh, there are some subsidies in this bill that I have a tough time trying to um, understand. And uh, on a program that's uh, very near and dear to my heart, the McGovern Dole International School Feeding Program, that uh, was a program which is designed to feed hungry children in school settings in four countries around the world. An incredible success, um, but that that was a program that received 840 million dollars in mandatory spending over five years, uh, and the farm bill left the house, uh, and then to the process it got reduced to, um, to 84 million dollars in mandatory funding, and um, it is beyond my comprehension uh, that some, especially in the in the Senate, um, uh, worked to undercut what we had here in the house. Um, it means uh, that we 
can't feed hungry kids. Uh, and in some cases, it may mean that uh, we take the mouths out of hungry kids. We can't find out and make it up in terms of discretionary money uh, down the road. But I, um, I look forward to working with the chairman and, and members of the Appropriations Committee and, and trying to uh, make sure that this program is uh, adequately funded. Um, having said that, um, I am I'm going to support this bill, and I'm going to strongly support this bill uh, because of the food and nutrition title. Uh, it is a, it is a this is a significant um, improvement a major improvement uh, uh, in food and nutrition programs at a time that uh, people desperately need it. Uh, there are people in the United States of America who are going hungry. There are people who can't figure out where they're going to get the resources to put the next meal on the table. There are kids who go to school hungry. Uh, there are people who are showing up in emergency rooms uh, at hospitals all across this country who are hungry and. Um, and I appreciate the fact that 73 percent uh, is going to nutrition, uh, but it is absolutely necessary. I mean, with energy costs going up, with food costs going up, with the cost of everything going up, uh, people cannot, cannot make ends meet. And so this is a substantial, this is substantial, um, and, it's, and it is a big deal. Uh, and I think people who care about um, the, uh, the cause of hunger, people who, um, who want to deal effectively with this uh, crisis that we're now faced with, uh, you know, despite all the other things in this bill that may not be perfect in our eyes, I think that this is cause enough uh, for us to be able to support this bill. I look forward to supporting it on the floor. So thank you. Mr. Barr. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and let me uh, join uh, both of my colleagues in congratulating you. Uh, I was never worried about Colin at all because I know what a uh, tough guy he is, although I know uh, uh, we've had several conversations through this process, and it has been uh, a, uh, a challenge. Um, I will say that um, there are obviously, as everyone else has said, some good things in this bill. And, uh, uh, but I, I am, I'm very concerned about it. I was just listening to Mr. McGovern talk about the issue of nutrition. And uh, obviously, we don't want to be taking food from the mouths of babes anywhere in the world. There are a billion people, a billion people in the world today who are faced with either malnutrition or starvation, and it's a serious crisis. We all know that, right? I mean, we recognize this global food crisis that exists today. And I will say that um, I think that there are a number of factors that come into play on this that really concern me greatly. And uh, we're partly to blame, and the developing world is partly to blame for this crisis. The developing world, in large part, because they have failed to open up their markets. They have failed in the quest that we're constantly make to encourage greater trade liberalization. And for that reason, many in these developing countries are unable to get onto the first rung of the economic ladder. And um, they uh, are uh, really, really uh, making a big mistake, I believe, as we seek to deal with this problem. The second problem is really ours. And frankly, it's part of the concern that I have uh, with this bill. I'll agree with, with Jim that it's uh, far from being a, a perfect bill. I have always uh, been a, a strong opponent of farm subsidization. If you look at, and you, Colin, and I have discussed this for many years, and if you look at two-thirds of the world farm subsidies, two-thirds of the world farm subsidies, they go to the agriculture sector of the European Union, and the agriculture sector of the United States of America. And I, I've got to say that if you couple the lack of trade liberalization on the part of developing nations with the incredible ag subsidies that have existed, I believe that that has played a role in exacerbating the problem that Mr. McGovern is seeking to address, and we all very much want to address. And so um, the United States of America is the world's leader. Just like the distinguished chair of this committee, my state of California doesn't have as its number one industry uh, the entertainment industry, the telecommunications industry, the high-tech industry, the defense industry, the aerospace industry. It is the agriculture industry that is number one in my state. And I recognize the importance of that. Uh, but I, and, and I, I recognize the importance of specialty crops, which which she mentioned, very important in California as well. But I do think that if we are going to seriously take on this issue, uh, that we're going to have to provide the U.S. leadership role in encouraging developing nations to move in this direction of 
more market opening opportunities, and at the same time, it's going to be very important for us to, um, to reduce the level of subsidization that we've had. Now, I will um, tell you that we all know that Secretary Schaefer has said that's the reason that he's going to encourage the President to veto the bill. And we know that message has come forward, that the Secretary of Agriculture is encouraging a veto of this legislation. And that's why um, I don't want to feel sorry for you, Colin, because it sounds like there might be a lot of work ahead, even though we've gotten to this point. Uh, and uh, in light of that, I will say that um, I think that it is going to, uh, going to be tough. Having said that, I will, will tell you that while everyone has talked about this bill, just sort of a, on, on the, the budget question of being PAYGO compliant, um, I, I am concerned. We just, uh, about five minutes ago, were handed the letter addressed to you today from the Congressional Budget Office on the issue of, of PAYGO. And um, Adam just handed me a copy of the rules here. And Rule 21, Section 10B states very clearly, after the beginning of a new calendar year and before consideration of a concurrent resolution on the budget, the most recent baseline estimates supplied by the Congressional Budget Office consistent with Section 257 of the Balanced Budget and Emergency Deficit Control Act of 1985 need to be used. And that's not what's being done here. That's not what's being done here. And so I think that we need to be very specific in looking at the fact that we are not using in compliance with this request to deal with this budget item. And what it says right here in paragraph two of the letter to you is relative to CBO's March 08 baseline projections, we estimate that enacting HR 249 would increase direct spending by about $3.6 billion over the 10 year period, assuming that the legislation would remain in effect throughout this period. Joint Committee on Taxation and Congressional Budget Office estimates that revenues would increase under the legislation by $700 million over the same period of time. And so we obviously do have uh, a problem here uh, as we look at the, the whole issue of, um, of being com compliant here. And I will say personally, uh, again, I congratulate you, you guys, Bob, and everyone involved have worked very, very hard on this. But I, uh, I do have a number of concerns. And I'm not going to ask specific questions, but if you all want to comment on anything I've said, I certainly welcome it. Well, please, please. Um, Madam Chair, <clears throat> um, we've had significant problems with the other body. Um, <laughs> they uh, Join the club. <laughs> you know, they had a lot of stuff in this bill, some of which we got out, some of it we didn't. But their budget, their rules are different. I, and uh, they basically don't have any. Well, no, no. Uh, well. As I understand, the difference is this: they're under, a, they're operating under a situation where um, they use the baseline uh, that the bill was started under until a new budget resolution passes the House and the Senate. Uh, apparently, when we adopted these paygo rules or whatever it was at the beginning of this Congress, somehow or another, we got a provision in there that I think that says that once the budget uh, in the House is filed, then supposedly this new thing uh, takes place. Well, <clears throat> we've known about this for uh, three, four months, but the Senate is not going to uh, operate under anything other than 07 to 17. Uh, you can't pass a bill that has one body using one set of rules and another body using another. Uh, and frankly, as I understand it, over the last, I don't know, 20 years, we've always follow the procedure under Republicans and Democrats, what, whatever baseline you started the bill with, you followed through. So we are, I, I guess, going to require a technical adjustment here, but we are meeting the PAYGO rules under the, under the uh, regime that so we started the bill with. you're not going to waiver, then. You're not going to request any kind of waiver to... Well, we don't have a waiver of, a waiver of PAYGO, no. We just uh, okay. have a technical issue here to get the two bills to conform with each other. Uh, because this, uh, Mr. Spratt actually talked about this on the floor the other day, uh, that, that this was a problem and this is how they decided to resolve it. Uh, so as I understand it, back when you guys were in charge, that's the way you operated too, that you, you once you started under that baseline, you, you finished that bill under that baseline. I really appreciate every single day that people hold up 
our leadership is a model. <laughs> which the majority does on a daily basis. More of an excuse. Uh, this you all have an excuse. An excuse for your behavior. Exactly. Not at all. Thanks, Not thanks, at uh, all. I'm proud of thanks. it. Thanks. You're, you're proud of the model that we've set? Uh, that, uh, yes. That, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, do you want to comment yes. on that? Uh, well, I wanted to comment to the first thing that you said, mm -hmm. and uh, you make an extremely good point. Uh, and that is about uh, the distortion uh, in the marketplace, uh, in, particularly in uh, uh, the payments and support uh, to European countries and, and to the U.S. And, you know, what I would say to you is American agriculture, I, 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 when the play, playing field is level, I have no uh, problem that I know that American agriculture can compete and be very competitive. The fact that they're actually competing uh, competitively today with these other countries that have payment uh, assistance much higher levels than the U.S. Absolutely. And so uh, I, I look forward and I was hopeful uh, that uh, this Doha round would be more fruitful because I think it, at the point in time where we, we, we get the governments uh, out of the uh, manipulation and, uh, and the pricing scheme of, of just about anything that you can think of, uh, I think then that, that it's in better long term. The problem that we have and what this farm... I do appreciate that, by the way, Renee, I'll tell you, I wish you could convince Colin of the same thing, yeah. because he and I have had this discussion again. Uh, going back is to that this, this farm bill uh, performs as a, a safety net and, and is, is much less uh, of a, a just a, a, a payment for nothing that some people want to paint this, but that, uh, for example, during the history of this farm bill, uh, there were a couple of years where the, the safety net was, was in place. But for a number of years, including uh, this year, uh, very few, if any, uh, commodities will receive uh, any support payments uh, uh, under, under the Farm Bill. And so uh, I think that's an important thing for folks to, to, to uh, because I hear people saying, well, they're going to get paid. In their, in, well, in many cases, they will not receive uh, uh, some of the payments under this. But I think we do need to work long term. Uh, on our trade agreements and 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 get the other countries uh, to come to the table uh, allow American goods to, to come in many of them use excuses that uh, well we're our, our agricultural products are genetically modified and so they, they somehow are spooky mm. uh, but uh, you know uh, th that's not the case but it's it makes an argument that they use to distort American cotton well, you're absolutely cotton. right I mean we've seen the uh, the Doha round and real trouble over uh, this issue and I do think again um, we need to do all that we can to encourage that diminution of that subsidization within the largest subsidizer the European Union and my view is uh, you know I'm, I'm not quite where you are I mean I think that we should do it by example and I think that we should do everything that we can to continue to apply international pressure to drive down that level of taxpayer subsidization, especially as we uh, look at this challenge. So thank you very much. Thank Madam you. Chair, could I please weigh in please. on this? I, I, yes. I, you know, these direct payments that are, frankly, at this point, the only money that farmers are getting are these direct payments that were set up in 1996 under the Freedom to Farm. <clears throat> and we, they were decoupled from production. Uh, the idea was that we were going to make these payments to farmers. They were supposed to decline over seven or eight years, and they were supposed to be eliminated uh, in 2003, I believe it was. Well, and the idea was to be to get to where David is talking about, have you know, get the government out of, you know, uh, deciding what crops to plant. We got the planting flexibility that came with that, so you could receive the payments and plant whatever you want. Now we're being criticized for getting these payments because people in the city are saying, "Well, you're getting these payments, you're not." that are not tied to anything and, you know, and you're making all this money and you're getting these payments, well, you know, it, it kind of feels like we're in a whipsaw here sometimes. But what people need to remember <coughs> is that this is a very expensive, uh, risky business. Mm -hmm. And, in the, you know, in the process of freedom to farm, uh, they, at the time they said prices are always going to be good, like they're saying today. And I think it was 98. 99. In both of those years, we had to spend over $30 billion, extra money, to keep the farmers in business each year. That's the whole amount that we're, we're forecasting in this bill for the whole five years for farmers. was spent in one year, not just one year, but two years in a row to keep people in business. So you got to be, I think, somewhat careful with this ideology. And now in 2002, they, 
uh, changed that around a little bit. They kept the direct payments and brought these other things up. Uh, I'm very worried going forward here with the prices being what they are, land prices going up, fertilizer tripling, diesel fuel tripling, uh, the costs that we have out there, the safety net that we have in place in this bill, if this thing goes south, is going to be a big mess. <clears throat> so <clears throat> I agree with Randy, and I, I'm coming around to your way of thinking a little bit, that if we could get all the governments out of this thing, we'd wow. be fine here in the United that States. That is, but, I mean, that, there's a but, dramatic move for, for you, uh, Colin, but, because we've you know, had this discussion at length, and you told I just me in the past. Pessimistic. Whenever Charlie, well, Charlie Stenholm, <laughs> well, I know, I mean, and I try to be a, an optimistic realist on this. Charlie Stenholm, of course, shared the view, and then, you know, the one that I've outlined here on that, the one that Ar Randy's arguing, and, and, uh, and you always have opposed that in the past. Well. I mean, in discussions that we've had. Yeah, I, I, I think that a bigger factor in the developing world is not, I mean, I think the trade liberalization <clears throat> is a factor. But the bigger problem we have in those countries is that uh, they have not developed the agriculture that, right. they, that they could. Well, and one, of the, know, reasons, and they one won't. of the reasons that they haven't, though, of course, is because if you look at the EU and the U.S., uh, I, I coupled wouldn't. with, again, there, and, and Randy uh, agreed, not in an agreement on this, <laughs> did not engage in the kind of market opening which is important, and that has played a role in the fact that we've got this food, this hunger crisis. Well, I, uh, I think there's some, uh, that argument holds some weight, but a much bigger problem is, you know, the political, cultural issues of those countries. I mean, Africa I agree has that. enough land and water to produce not only all the food for Africa, but they could export. No, I agree but they're not that. doing you know, for different reasons, political reasons, corruption. Absolutely. You know, it's very frustrating, and trade alone is not going to fix that. Yeah, It'll I mean, help. But, but that, is, that will be a byproduct it will, yeah. of fixing these but, things. But and we've got to get the part other. Of, it's one of the components. Thank you very much. Sorry to take so much time. No, no thank you. And, and I want to stress you there's an immediate concern, too, in terms of the issue of hunger. There, this bill will respond to an immediate concern where yeah. some of the things that we're talking about here may be long term in implications. Mr. Hastings. <clears throat> thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. It was uh, pointed out earlier um, uh, that um, Mr. Peterson and his colleagues on the Agriculture Committee in a bipartisan fashion have done extraordinary work. And I personally uh, applaud you, uh, uh, Chairman Peterson, uh, for uh, your uh, persistence in dealing with um, uh, this matter, uh, sometimes in even uh, a Solomonic manner, notwithstanding the fact that you had to deal um, uh, with members in the other body who have legitimate concerns that have caused um, uh, considerable uh, changes uh, in this measure. It was also pointed out uh, that the president has uh, had recommended to him by uh, the Agriculture Commissioner, Mr. Schaefer, uh, that he veto this bill. That's the prerogative of the administration. But it would be seriously regrettable in light of uh, the great needs that exist that are pointed out uh, by uh, uh, the actions that are taken if this bill holds and um, in its form, or uh, even if modified in the Senate, becomes law. Uh, there, there's a lot of pain in our country and a lot of pain in this world. And uh, political pain um, uh, would not be uh, the thing that would help us uh, uh, in this era, in my judgment, um, notwithstanding uh, the, uh, the president's <coughs> prerogatives. I also find it passing strange that he didn't exercise that prerogative when our colleagues uh, on the other side were in the majority, but one time. And that one time was on the subject of stem cell research, yet another matter of considerable import in this country um, uh, that um, our chair lady of um, um, uh, this committee uh, has worked on for a substantial period of time. <clears throat> I'd like, Mr. Chairman, with your permission, to include um, a letter uh, that um, I received uh, from uh, the Commissioner of Agriculture of the state of Florida, who happens to be a Republican. Um, and I'd like uh, to offer this into the record and then excise from it a couple of comments. Without objection. Thank you. He, Mr. Brunson, indicates we're writing today to enthusiastically support uh, the conference uh, report and its cites the bill. 
This legislation, which enjoys strong bipartisan support, will provide substantial benefits to Florida, including our agricultural products. I will not uh, go into the letter, but I do think um, it critical to understand the bipartisan effort uh, that uh, you have put forward, uh, Chairman <coughs> Peterson, and its fruition in the minds of others. Uh, and I would urge if we were to go around the country, I would imagine we could find a substantial numbers of uh, their counterparts as commissioners of agriculture or whatever its designation in the respective states uh, who have similar feelings. Some of the people who are signatories to um, uh, Commissioner uh, Bronson's letter are the Audubon of Florida, the Dade County Farm Bureau, the Florida Association of Food Banks or the Florida Cattlemen Association, Florida Citrus Mutual, or the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, the Florida Farm Bureau, Florida Nursery Growers and Landscape Association, the Florida Sugarcane League, and the University of Florida, and my alma mater, Florida A&M University. On that note, I'd like to say uh, that um, I, I know for a fact Mr. Peterson, that you have reached out to every aspect of the uh, Congress um, in an effort to try to get this measure passed. And I'm deeply and profoundly appreciative of the fact that virtually every measure offered by the Congressional Black Caucus insofar as their priorities um, uh, were met um, in all of their particulars or at least as much as the budget would allow. I also would be terribly remiss if we did not uh, compliment uh, Chairman Rangel um, uh, for his efforts. Uh, much of the behind the scenes efforts that many members never come to know takes place in rooms that many members never get to be in. And I am not one of those that is in those rooms, but from time to time I am. And I have seen some of the things um, uh, that have been lacking in terms of what's necessary for this bill. I take a few more moments to cite to the fact that Florida, as my good friend from California pointed to the importance of agriculture in his state, as did Ms. Slaughter um, about New York, Florida is the 10th largest agricultural state in the nation. Uh, in my district alone, uh, the 50% of the winter vegetables that are grown in this country are grown in mine and Tim Pahoney's, uh, 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 Mahoney's congressional district. Which also causes me to reminisce just a moment about my own childhood. And I would that all of the members of Congress would have had the experiences that I had. All them people that live in the city have to eat. And somehow or another, they don't quite understand how that food gets to that market. Well, some of us do, in light of the fact that I was born in an area that at one time was the fern capital of this country. I also went to high school in what was the celery capital, Sanford, Florida. Uh, it was the winter celery capital. Kalamazoo, Michigan was the summer, our capital, cap, cap, capital of celery. I grew up in the citrus belt, picked beans, cut chicory, stripped celery, clipped tangerines and pulled oranges. And I would that other people would have that opportunity. And one of the things that I'm proudest of is that as a teenager, I went on a migrant truck uh, to Pahokee and Belle Glade, Florida. We call it going to Pahokee on the muck. And I picked beans there. And this country is so great that now I'm their representative. Uh, very few people know about um, uh, the farm entries um, uh, that I have the pleasure of representing. Some know that I represent the second largest sugar producing um, uh, district in the country. Uh, and that industry, I won't even begin to talk about its economic impact. Um, I think uh, it is easy to understand uh, that it means an awful lot of jobs to over 25,000 hardworking white and black and Latino Americans. Um, I thank uh, the committee for including provisions to insist, assist this important industry um, um, by uh, enhancement of the sugar to ethanol program. And I thank the committee for including the Pollinator Protection Act. This is something uh, that Dennis Cardoza, my friend on the Rules Committee, and I uh, spotted uh, as uh, a problem. 
And for all of y'all sitting out there that don't understand the importance of bees, and I've taken a lot of um, uh, bee fun talk, uh, <coughs> and my office has been one of the hives of the buzz. Uh, uh, even the blogs have taken to coming after us. But if there ain't no bees, there ain't no food. And so this is uh, a critically important measure as well. I also applaud the bill's uh, effort to address the rising food prices here at home and overseas. And I agree with my good friend and colleague, Mr. McGovern. I wish we could have done more, and I'm hopeful that at some point we will be. One final measure that I'd like to point to is the global food security concerns. Uh, and since my colleague is so long on trade, in developing uh, nations, uh, perhaps he would be mindful uh, that there are trade preferences for Caribbean nations or Caribbean nations and promoting duty-free imports from Haiti. And for anybody that doesn't believe it, then come go with me, all uh, members uh, that are going uh, to Haiti soon, where citizens are now forced to eat mud cake uh, to survive. That's in our hemisphere. That isn't in Darfur. That isn't in Indonesia or Myanmar. That's in our hemisphere uh, that we are permitting that to happen. I find it um, uh, passing strange uh, as a nation with the resources that we have would not be able to do better by Haiti as well as other countries in the Caribbean that are developing, that have met many of these same problems. I might add, if we were in Europe talking about bananas, we'd be talking about yet another of the crisis levels that is perpetrated on an area uh, that I think is deserving more attention. There was one other thing that Mr. Dreyer mentioned, and that's that the bill might require $3.2 billion in 10 years. Uh, that's not chump change, but it is vital for nutrition. It is vital for all of the measures that you have put forward here, and my hope is uh, uh, that you don't get too many more lectures from my colleague about PAYGO in light of the fact that you and others are authors of the PAYGO. If I had my way in the new administration, you would be the chairman of the Agriculture uh, Commission or the Secretary of Agriculture, and then maybe we will get some down money. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Diaz Spallard. Thank you very much, Chairman, and I want to thank uh, both of you. Uh, followed your work uh, closely. Uh, also, Mr. Goodlatte, uh, it's, been, it's been not only an extraordinary amount of work, uh, but uh, we know it's been difficult, and we thank you for it. Uh, and I uh, uh, also am a, not only a strong supporter, but an admirer of American agriculture. And I agree with what both of you have said uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, describing it and its ability to compete. Uh, and, I'm, and I'm pleased that a number of my colleagues have spoken about uh, the importance of agriculture to the states. Mr. Hastings just described very eloquently the importance of agriculture to the state that I'm honored to represent. Uh, and I think it was very appropriate for him to mention uh, the uh, support uh, of our agriculture uh, commissioner. Uh, this is evidently a bipartisan product. Uh, I have had long discussions with Mr. Mr. Goodlap in the last weeks, and he has pointed out, uh, obviously, the difficulty of the work that he's been involved in with you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, but uh, it's evident that this is a work product that is going to receive strong support on the floor. And uh, uh, I think it's important that we, as, as both of you have talked about, we realize that times are not always good in agriculture and that we have to have a safety net when times are not good. Um, it's important not only for economic reasons, but for national security reasons that we save American agriculture. Uh, and so uh, I uh, commend both of you, as well as all of your committee, uh, for its hard work and uh, look forward to supporting legislation. Thank you. Ms. Matsui. Uh, thank you. Chairman, and I want to thank <coughs> Peterson um, for his hard work and the work on a bipartisan manner. And uh, uh, I didn't think I was going to get about the farm bill, but you realize how it affects almost every part of this country, uh, whether you're in an urban area as I am, or a suburban or a rural area. And uh, the fact that 
you know, we start out as sort of a farming community or um, country. And uh, it's interesting now to see this bill being sort of a transition bill uh, as we move forward to the next farm bill. That, um, we're looking to see how things have changed in farming and then how conservation practices have changed and how we're looking at uh, where food is being used in a very active way. I have to tell you that this has been a wonderful experience for me to get involved in and watching you trying to uh, balance all the various interests as you move forward. I saw you walking around the house chamber trying to make sure I saw you walking to various groups and trying to come to some sort of understanding and I have to thank you very much for working so hard on that. Um, I'm very supportive of this bill. Uh, I believe it's very important, the increase in the nutrition title and the robust commitment to uh, conservation and, and reforms really to the commodity title. It's really a farm bill that I can really support and uh, I also want to thank you very much uh, for uh, Chairman Peterson and the committee for including the uh, new agriculture water enhancement program to this bill. It's uh, important for producers to achieve water quality and to address water quantity concerns and especially also to um, designate the Sacramento River uh, watershed uh, as a national priority in this, which will help us um, environmentalists and landowners work together to really ensure that we have a comprehensive approach to the Sacramento River watershed, which is sort of the whole part of the third of California. So do appreciate that. Appreciate your coming to see us there to look at it. And uh, I thank you very much. And uh, uh, I definitely support the bill. And um, we're back with that. Thank you. Mr. Hastings of Washington. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me uh, add my congratulations to both of you for, for getting this farm bill. And uh, while I know uh, uh, Chairman Peterson wanted to get this farm bill done by the end of September last year. That was his goal. Uh, he didn't, and, and you can only conclude that it was your perseverance, frankly, that uh, got us this far. And I think that deserves the, the plaudits that uh, is deserved. I also know that uh, this farm bill is not a product of just this year. Uh, it's a product of a lot of hearings and work done between the last farm bill and this bill. Uh, when you're position was reversed with Mr. Goodlatte. When he was chairman, you were in the rank of members. I know you had a number of hearings around the country. You had a hearing uh, in my uh, in my district in, in Yakima, Washington. Mr. Cardoza was there. Uh, at that hearing, you heard loud and clear from the type of agriculture mix I have, especially the crop part of it, that uh, don't tell us what to plant, when to plant, how to plant, but give us the necessary tools to plant good crops like research dollars, and you've met that. You've met that, and I for that, I think you are to be congratulated. And I'm also pleased that you have maintained the funding for the market access program, which also was important to uh, specialty crops. And I might say, uh, while we talk about specialty crops as being something nobody knows about, I have a hard time uh, uh, saying that apples is a specialty crop, or potatoes is a specialty crop, or pears is a specialty crop, or cherries is a specialty crop, or grapes which are all grown in my district. I'm just naming a few of them. They're all specialty crops. They're a big part of, uh, of our mix. But the conversation that uh, Mr. Dreyer had uh, in exchange with Mr. Peterson I thought was rather interesting from this standpoint. Uh, when Mr. Peterson came in, he said, wait, this is not a farm bill. It's a food bill, different title. And yet, get the uh, graphs that you came out from the committee talks about farm bill spending, farm bill total outlays, <laughs> Farm bill outlays above the March 27 CBO. Uh, well, I, Very I, hard to change people's. That, uh, that, is, <laughs> that is precisely the point I'm going to make. And that is, this is widely said as a farm bill, but when you look at the outlays and you see that three fourths of it is not farm related, I think that this may, especially uh, uh, Mr. Peterson, when you suggested that you might have some different thoughts with the exchange that Mr. Dreyer had, this may be the last time that we see a farm bill in this form. Uh, because I think that uh, while the, the other programs uh, are important, uh, the focus that I have from my district is all obviously the, the farm aspect to that. And as difficult as this was put together and the big increases in the other, quote, not non-farm, hands-on farm parts of this bill, this could very likely be the last farm bill that we see uh, in, in this, this form. But having said all that, that'll play itself uh, out over time. Uh, and, uh, and you are to be uh, really congratulated for your persistence. Both of you uh, uh, 
because I know this has been a long, uh, we've had conversations where I've been asking if you had any fun. You never did tell me affirmatively. <laughs> but at any rate, uh, thank you for the work that, uh, that you have done. Thank you. Mr. Cardoza. Uh, Mr. Chairman, oh, I, Mr. Uh, yes. uh, I just want to uh, commend uh, Dennis before he starts. Uh, Dennis is a member of my committee and uh, one of my subcommittee chairmen, and he has just done an outstanding job <clears throat> and uh, in his area where we've uh, crafted this new part of the farm bill that uh, Doc was talking about, and uh, it wouldn't have happened without Dennis. And I just well, thank want you. to recognize uh, his work and his leadership and uh, um, his legacy that he's created here. So. Well, he does a great job on this committee, too. <clears throat> Mr. Cardoza? Thank you. I, I, I'm not sure I can remember all that, but I appreciate it very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to start out by talking a little bit about what Mr. Hastings talked about, and that was the fact that this committee started uh, under the chairmanship of Mr. Goodlot at the time, traveling around the country. We, uh, as a committee, we actually got to be very good friends through this process because if we travel together all throughout the country. You see each other's districts, you learn each other's issues, and people talk about why certain things in this bill may not make sense, but it makes absolute sense, possibly, to someone's district. Ms. Max, we've talked about a water issue that's absolutely critical to her district. Especially crops mean everything. Mr. Gisbelard's district, Mr. Hastings' district, Mr. Hastings' district of mine. It's just the perspective, and we get sent here by our constituents to represent our districts. And so sometimes it may not make sense from someone from New York City that something's in this bill. But it is absolutely a bill that takes a hard look at those needs. And we did over 10 hearings. I don't know if that, Mr. Chairman, you were at all of them. It was Leverage Baldwin. Yeah. Where we traveled around, we tried to truly understand what was happening to agriculture, to food nutrition, all over this country. Energy policy, we saw in Minnesota, uh, windmills and, and uh, cellulose being developed, and, and truly some new visionary things, much of which is incorporated into this act and never gets talked about. And I just want to take a minute to point that out. Um, I will also tell you that what the chairman has talked about with regard to the PAYGO rules is only a tip of the iceberg with the challenges that we've had dealing with the other body. Um, because they have this 60-vote um, filibuster um, closure initiative, because they have different PAYGO rules, because they have a different uh, way of doing business, uh, we put a pretty lean and mean bill in this house for the other body. And uh, we had significant challenges. And I will tell you straight up that um, oftentimes, in the early negotiations in particular, that um, my, our chairman was what I call the only adult in the room. And I say that not to, to disparage all the rest of them, but he often tough stands uh, that would, this bill would not be where it is today if we not done those things. And I know, because I was one of the witnesses to the inside of this bill, like uh, Mr. Hastings was talking about as a concrete. And I will tell you that uh, he has done some tremendous work. It is not perfect. And can you put some things apart? If you want to fill this bill, if you have the interest of trying to fill this bill, you can take things apart. But I will tell you, as, as my colleague, uh, Mr. Nagelauer, said, that this is a good piece of work. And it's PAYGO compliant from the year that we started working on it. Um, I want to point out a couple of things that I will. Uh, I, I will talk a little bit about this committee. Frankly, this committee was very interested in the Farm Bill. I'm very uh, interested in the this about the title. Mr. Dean Pillar, Mr. Hastings, on a bipartisan basis, and all of us on this side of the aisle were very committed to this wrong specialty crop section. We communicated that to the Agriculture Committee. I want to thank the chairman for that. Uh, it, it, it's important work to do. Second of all, uh, I want to talk about the commodity title a little bit. Because while the chairman gets bruised for representing his district and his region of the country, I want everyone in the room to take a very close look at this budget. The 2002 Farm Bill had a ratio of nutrition to commodity program of about two to one. Two parts nutrition for every part that went dollars to the commodity program. This year, if you take those same numbers and divide it, the ratio of nutrition to commodity prices is five to one. And that is significant 
Okay. I also ask you all, I'm defy you to tell me any part of government that has shrunk over the last six, eight years. And I will tell you that you won't be able to find anything but that program. So folks can disparage it. I would have liked to see different kinds of reform and more possibly. But let me tell you, that's a significant uh, uh, reduction. And there's an editorial in my paper at home today. Uh, they're very complimentary of a lot of the work that we did, but they said we should have you know, done much more there. Well, if they could come to this institution and get a bill passed for some of the Midwestern senators that have done more, I'd like to see it. I think it's pretty miraculous that we're here today, frankly. And so I'm going to ask us all to support this bill. I certainly support the rule. Uh, I, I just want to say a couple more things. That uh, I worked with a lot of folks. Uh, Mr. Gisbillard, your brother, was very helpful in this bill. Mr. Putnam was very helpful uh, in your conference. Mr. Randall's already been mentioned, but the one person who has not been mentioned and gets disparaged in her district, but has just absolutely been a leader for the entire country in this, that is the speaker. And she's looked after all the needs and all of the folks and forced compromise time and time again. I think the chairman has talked about that as well. But she has really done a fabulous job on this. Uh, I don't say that lightly, I, I, I say that with by watching it and experiencing it. And uh, I think there's a lot of folks who work hard to make a product that, as we've all said, is not perfect, but it is uh, something we should be proud of. I want to agree with uh, the gentleman's uh, comments about the speaker, and I'd add Rosa DeLauro to that, uh, <coughs> yeah, who's, I, who's also been incredibly helpful. I, if, I would, if I could just say, I mean, I've been through some real wars here, uh, but without the speaker standing behind me, and she got the heck beat out of her back home, and you should have seen what they did in her paper, you know, because she was backing me, you know, and how terrible I was. But as Dennis said, I mean, you look at, I'm the chairman of the committee, and I have a district that is all these commodities that took this cut, <laughs> you know, and I'm still pretty good shape back home, uh, I think, <laughs> although I haven't been there too much. But um, I really give the speaker a lot of credit, because she has, she has taken a lot of flack. And she has been rock solid. I, I took her to Farm Fest in my district, big, <coughs> 30,000 people. She, something happened there. She just kind of bonded with those farmers, and she was eating pork chops on a stick, and they were driving around in the E85 golf cart. And, uh, and I think because of that and, and some other things, uh, she saw the importance of what we were doing, been around the country, and, uh, and without her standing behind us, on the committee, Dennis and I and the rest of us, uh, we wouldn't be here. So I want to echo it. Rosa as well. Rosa was, was the chair of the um, Appropriations right. and Agriculture Committee, and she's done great work. And Charlie Rangel. I mean, I, I, I don't know who can give uh, We've been trying to get a waiver uh, for Charlie Rangel uh, to be able to get him as a member of the Ag Committee. But I haven't figured out how to do that yet. We could do that in this committee, can we? It's an exclusive we? committee. I don't know if you guys can. <laughs> Handle that. He told me that after sitting through these, this conference, he couldn't believe how complex <laughs> agricultural policy was, and he wanted no part of your committee. <laughs> so uh, I'm not sure you take that off. Well, we'd, we'd love to have him. He, uh, <coughs> he really rose to the uh, challenge and the occasion, and Jim McCrary helped out as well, and um, uh, Earl Pomeroy. It was a team effort. And um, as Dennis said, it's not perfect, but um, it's a lot better than where we start. Mr. Sessions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you know, as I sit back and watch uh, both of you uh, do work here, it, uh, it really makes me feel good. For six years, I represented a rural district in Texas. And while some of the issues may be slightly different with cattle uh, as, as, as compared with some of the other commodities issues, uh, I think that it all really gets down to a way of life in rural areas and no matter which part of our country that produces uh, commodities or uh, agricultural products, uh, they really see a lot of things the same way. Uh, I'm, I'm pleased to see that uh, conservation programs and what's called here in conservation program transparency is going to really help out. Uh, Texas, Central Texas is no different than a lot of other places around the country. We get 16-inch rains and that take our, our soil 
into rivers. We spend a lot of money getting them out of rivers, getting them back upstream. Uh, we do a lot of things. We've heard some of our members talk very favorably about people that work in their districts. It's the character of their districts. It's the character of the people who try and help provide good food for people. We heard Mr. Dreyer talk very favorably, I think, about a warning about making sure the government keeps its position in place relative to uh, the free market. And, uh, you know, just sitting here now, I'm, I'm in a different district uh, than, than a rural district. I, well, I agree with a lot of what you said here, but it, it kind of reminded me I wish y'all could be an energy and commerce committee together where we could come here together and get our energy bill with the same sense of bipartisanship, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. the jobs, some 200,000 jobs that we lost in the mid 80s in agri in uh, energy sector, uh, pa pale in comparison to what would happen today and is happening today by not allowing America to be energy independent, by us having policies that take out jobs jobs that if we were in agriculture would be bipartisan, but because they're in energy and they probably deal perhaps with Texas and Oklahoma, it's political. And, and it, it saddens me. I mean, I, I enjoyed this feeling of this committee as you both were here today talking about with great respect men and the women who produce things good for our country and yet I look up and I see people back in Texas and consumers all across this country uh, literally being held hostage by what happens halfway around the world. Us fighting wars for energy. Us spending trillions of dollars that go to foreign countries, that go to perhaps our enemies. Uh, we, we sit here and talk in here about some of the pressure that's put on agriculture as a result of lack of energy independence. And yet, as I sit here, I, I would like to take the model of what y'all are doing and put that into an area that is very important for our country, and that is the ability to have energy independence as opposed to leaning on somebody else. I would say to you, if this were food, and we made it political, we might be having a look at somebody else, some, somewhere else, some other country, feeding America. But because it is perhaps bipartisan, it's in America. It's in America. And that's why we can gather together each other and say, yeah, I got a piece of that pie. So. You know, as this guy from Dallas, Texas, you know, the energy capital, uh, you know, even in this committee, it's not seen very, with much uh, fond attributes. Like to see us get closer. Like to see this committee, this Congress, learn from what we've seen today. Two people coming up here. Could be a controversial issue. Working through things. This committee proud of what they produce back home. But what I produce back home is energy. What I produce back home is energy independence. And what has always been really pretty good cost as compared to not picking on Starbucks, but you pay two twenty-five dollars for about 10 ounces of Starbucks. And that's real expensive as compared to a gallon of gasoline. And so, Proud to be on this committee. In some sense, I wish I still served a rural area. Real proud of what you've made, the progress with conservation, but still really disappointed that we can't have the same feeling about lowering the cost of gasoline and energy for this country. I sure wish we could do that. I yield back my time. Yes. I'll make a brief comment. Uh, well, I appreciate the gentleman's comment, and I would say that probably, uh, you know, once you get a get a farm bill, you know, done, and uh, I would tell you that probably is equally important the issue, not only just to the, to to agriculture, although it's going to be extremely important to 
agriculture that we get our arms around this because uh, while the commodity prices are up some, which is a good thing, unfortunately the input costs are up extreme is uh, uh, nearly as the same. As the gentleman said, uh, fertilizer. Yeah, fertilizer, diesel, uh, all of the input costs, uh, the transportation cost of many of the, the, the commodities that uh, some of the other panel members have been talking about, the quote specialty crops. So it is an issue that we have to address because there's not a safety net in this farm bill for uh, exorbitant uh, high energy prices. And so uh, it's, uh, and neither do American families have a <coughs> for uh, high energy prices. And so it is something I agree that we need to. Well, I, I appreciate the gentleman at taking stock of that because this country wants and needs a great farming rural food delivery system. Uh, I think Mr. Hastings said it best, you know, some people could show up at, the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Hastings said, you could show up at a food store and think that's where you get your milk. That's not where the milk comes from. Same thing is true of some other things, and I think energy is going important for us, so I appreciate it. Thank you, thank you. Mr. Welsh. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, a couple of things. I, uh, Texas, um, it's kind of an extraordinary thing that done in this farm bill. I've done that in Congress. Uh, <coughs> I haven't seen anything this complicated. I think this way, the Agriculture Committee had a defendant. And uh, the rules committee we had, as uh, Dennis mentioned, uh, really pretty much all of us had uh, real concerns about certain aspects of the government that did well in closely restricting and that vital. Uh, as did with uh, the significant reform on in addition on the uh, specialty crops, it's vital. Uh, and you somehow managed to put it all together, and you're going to be criticized, we all are, uh, because uh, we always want to be able to that. Um, sometimes, most of the time, we call it a short. But in fact, on your reforms, you did reduce the, uh, the direct payments. Uh, and I support, support that. I'm president of the President of the Union. Well, thank you both very much, and to your professional staff as well for uh, a great improvement over our current food policy. Now, on the 16% related to commodities, you have taken substantial steps towards reform with the subsidies and instituted the, the first ever caps on direct payments. Um, I think we should have gone farther, and I encourage you to do so in the next Farm Bill. Uh, 
But those concerns were far outweighed by the other 80% of the bill that, like my colleagues have said today, um, contains a, a historic new commitment uh, to making healthy food affordable uh, for American families. Um, and I want to thank Mr. McGovern, my colleague here, and Speaker Pelosi and uh, Rosa DeLauro from Connecticut for, her, for their outstanding work uh, on nutrition and, like I said, making the healthy food more affordable for, for families. Uh, an important part of that is the attention to the fresh fruits and vegetables. And coming from Florida, like my colleague Mr. Hastings, uh, Florida citrus and Florida strawberries, and you can go on and on with our great vegetables. That's an important part of the, what you've done to reinvigorate our policy direction that children, especially, should have right. fresh fruit and vegetables in school uh, and organic farming as well. Because in doing so, you're addressing the, uh, the fact that we've got to improve lifestyles in this country. Our lifestyles must become healthier. And we must address this, uh, this epidemic of childhood obesity that is going to lead to greater costs down the road in our health care system. Uh, I also wanted to salute my, my colleague from Florida, Mr. Hastings, uh, who now I will call Farmer Hastings mm -hmm. after his <laughs> explanation of his, his, um, his youth, and to, to Chairman Rangel for the work they have done. And thank you, Mr. Chairman, for including the uh, trade preferences for Haiti in the countries in the Caribbean Basin. It's, those trade preferences are really to address uh, poverty and hunger in those nations. And uh, on a day when, when a new uh, boat of Haitians trying to escape the intense poverty in their nation was, was discovered with folks drowned uh, in the ocean, I think this is a, a great step forward. So thank you for your leadership. And Mr. Hastings, thank you for your work on that. Thank you. So I might, uh, oh, yes. you know, I've been reading Mr. Rangel's book, yeah. and he worked on a farm when he was young in Virginia. And so, uh, you know, he's back to his agriculture roots now, uh, like Mr. Hastings is. I never worked on a farm. My, my father owned, owned a liquor store. We grew beer bottles. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, you know, yeah, that's an egg product. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's lots of nutrition in that. Hops and barley. Yeah. We all knew that. We all knew that. <laughs> Mr. Curie. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, gentlemen, thank you very much. Uh, much of what I want to say has already been said, but I would be remiss if I didn't thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you know, my district, uh, I did a couple of um, meetings on both ends of my district. Uh, we have a lot of dairy farms, <clears throat> one in Herkimer County, one in Cleveland County, and the dairy farmers, almost to the person, said, what are you going to do to help us? And I'm very happy to say thank you for what you did with the MILC. It's incredible. It's a big change for us in the Northeast and upstate New York, and uh, I appreciate it. What you've done for, especially the crops and so in the uh, cellulosic ethanol as well. Uh, that's going to be, I think, an important part for us in upstate New York. Uh, we have actually a plant opening up right in my own district. So I appreciate uh, the foresight and what you did, and the bill was a great bill, and uh, thank you. I appreciate it very much. Ms. Sutton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I would first associate myself with the remarks of my colleague from Massachusetts, not his most recent remarks <laughs> about the liquor store, but the earlier remarks. Um, and I thank you very much for the persistence, for the hard, long slog that it's been. Um, and you know, as a new member, watching, watching you work this and come out with a product that truly is going to make a, a big and good difference in many, many lives, despite what we've heard about the imperfections and I also could add to that chorus, but I won't. I will just say this. With respect to nutrition and what you're doing for um, getting assistance to, to the food banks, where I come from, <coughs> that exists and is unfortunately growing at our food banks is beyond alarming. This is truly a, a, a lifeline that we're throwing out there to people. And lest we think it's, it's people who, um, who don't work Oftentimes, the, the, the folks in these lines today are folks who are out there working their hearts out or are looking for work or trying. They are the family members who, of, of, of those who are serving right now in um, Afghanistan and Iraq. It is, um, it is an amazing thing. They are the people who last year or the year before were giving donations to the food bank. 
who are now, um, unfortunately, in that kind of need. So um, with respect to, to them, thank you, uh, and thank you for all that is good, and we'll continue to work on what we need to fix that is not as good as we would like it to be. Thank you. Thank you both very much for being here. Thank you for your incredible work and your patience for this uh, hearing. And um, we look forward to having this bill on the floor tomorrow and hopefully a strong vote so we don't have to even think about veto. So right. I appreciate very much you being here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that concludes the hearing portion of this uh, bill, and the uh, chair will be in receipt of a motion. Absolutely. You can vote. Chairman. Yeah, Mr. Hastings, Florida. I move that we grant the conference report accompanying HR 2419, the Farm, Nutrition, and Bioenergy Act of 2007, a rule waiving all points of order against the conference report and against its consideration. The rule provides one hour of general debate, equally divided and controlled by the chairperson and ranking minority member of uh, the Committee on Agriculture. The rule also provides uh, that the conference report shall be considered as read. Finally, uh, the rule provides one motion to recommit. Sounds good. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hastings. Uh, are there any, any discussion, any uh, amendments? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Dreyer. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. And, uh, it was an interesting uh, educational opportunity for us to hear about the uh, agriculture agriculture interests of uh, all of our colleagues on the committee, so I uh, found it very enjoyable. I will say that um, as I look at this rule, one might uh, conclude that this is simply uh, a standard conference report rule. It is not. It is not. In fact, if one looks at the resolution on the bottom here, it's very clear that there is an attempt to lock down the rights of the minority when it comes to the notion of offering a possible motion to adjourn. And uh, so I will say that whether or not one is supportive of the final conference report, the work product from our friends on the, uh, the committees that were involved in this conference, this rule is not that. Okay. I also would say, uh, so I'm going to urge my colleagues to uh, to oppose this lockdown structure, which uh, you know has been uh, included in the rule. I also uh, want to say that uh, last week I made an attempt to to offer some very very warm and kind and. And uh, I thought what would be welcome management uh, advice to uh, our friends in the majority when it came to uh, a couple of uh, shell bills that are sitting in the uh, at the desk. And so I'm uh, I'm just defeated on that last week. I'm going to try again today in hopes that we might be able to. Uh, but I still don't for the life of me understand why in the world we have the military construction and veterans affairs appropriations bill and the homeland security appropriations bill sitting down there at the desk when both have already become public law and so i'm going to move that the committee amend the rule to add as a new section at the end of the resolution as follows that upon adoption of this resolution hr 2642 the fy08 military construction and veterans care appropriations bill and HR 2638, the fiscal year 08 Homeland Security Appropriations Bill, and their accompanying papers, be laid on the table. It's very simple and clear, and uh, this again is just helping to uh, Thank you. clean this up. So I'd urge my colleagues to support this uh, very modest uh, management uh, amendment to the uh, to the rule. Thank you for your suggestion. Uh, you've heard the gentleman's amendment. Uh, uh, all those in favor, say aye. Aye. 
Opposed, no. 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 Be the chair, the no's have voted on Mr. Chair. Let's go call the rolls. Mr. McGovern. No. Mr. Hastings of Florida. No. Ms. Matsui. No. Mr. Cardozo. Mr. Welch. No. Ms. Casper. No. Mr. Arcuri. No. Ms. Sutton. No. Mr. Dreyer. Aye. Mr. Diaz Ballard. Yes. Mr. Hastings of Washington. Aye. Mr. Sessions. Aye. Madam Chair. Clerk will report the total. Four yeas, seven nays. Motion not agreed to. Any other amendments? Yes, I have another amendment. Mr. Dreyer. Mr. Chairman, um, we had a lengthy discussion here with uh, Messrs. Peterson and Nagabauer on the whole issue of PAYGO. And there seemed to be some kind of concurrence. Mr. Hastings engaged in this. Uh, I wasn't lecturing anybody on PAYGO. I was simply reading the uh, Rule 21. And in light of the fact that everyone seems to concur that, <clears throat> that there is no violation of PAYGO, uh, I'd like to amend the rule, uh, and I, uh, I move that the committee amend the rule to waive all points of order against the conference report, which is what this rule basically does, accompanying the bill HR 2419, except for clause 10 of rule 21, which is what I read uh, to, um, to Mr. Peterson and Mr. Nagerbauer and for members of the committee when we were in the hearing process. So if, in fact, there is com complete compliance, there would be no reason in the world for us to waive Clause 10 of Rule 21, so I encourage my colleagues to, uh, to actually uh, excise that uh, provision, uh, allowing it to, uh, to remain as is. So I urge my colleagues to support that. Great. You've heard the gentleman's amendment. Uh, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. No. The chair, the noes have it. We have a record roll, Mr. Chairman. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. McGovern. No. Mr. Hastings of Florida. No. Ms. Matsui. No. Mr. Cardoza. Mr. Welch. No. Ms. Castor. Mr. Arcuri. No. Ms. Sutton. No. Mr. Dreyer. Aye. Mr. Diaz Ballard. Yes. Mr. Hastings of Washington. Aye. Mr. Sessions. Aye. Madam Chair. Clerk will report the total. Four yeas, seven nays. Motion is not agreed to. Any other amendments, sir? No, Mr. Chairman, I don't have any other amendments, but I will say again that uh, had this been the standard conference report rule, uh, I think that it would have been understandable regardless, again, of one's position on this. but. The notion of utilizing this rule to lock down and prevent members of the minority from having, uh, yeah, yeah, to offer the kinds of motions, motions to adjourn, other procedural motions, is, I think, a very uh, unfortunate action um, to to uh, to completely shut us out. So I'm going to urge my colleagues to oppose this uh, rule based on that. Thank you very much. Uh, the vote now occurs on the motion from the gentleman of Florida. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. No. Opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The clerk will re uh, call the roll. Mr. McGovern. Aye. Mr. Hastings of Florida. Aye. Ms. Matsui. Aye. Mr. Cardoza. Mr. Welch. Aye. Ms. Castor. Aye. Mr. Arcuri. Aye. Ms. Sutton. Aye. Mr. Dreyer. No. Mr. diaz Villard. No. Mr. Hastings of Washington. No. Mr. Sessions. No. Madam Chair. Clerk, report the total. Seven yeas, four nays. And motion is agreed to, and Mr. Cardoza will carry this for the uh, majority. And our friend from Pasco, Washington, Mr. Hastings, will manage for the Republicans. Terrific. And the chair will be in receipt of another motion. Mr. Gentleman Chairman, from Florida, Mr. offering the motion, I'd just yes. like to make mention of the fact that the chair lady um, is um, in a meeting that she's required to attend. And that's the uh, reason for her uh, uh, not being here to thank vote you for, during this period. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, Mr. Chairman, I move that the committee report a rule uh, providing for the adoption of SCON Res 70, the concurrent budget resolution for fiscal year 2009. The rule takes from the speaker's table SCON Res 70, adopts an amendment in the nature of a substitute consisting of the text of H. Conres of 312 as adopted by the House, adopts a S. Conres 70 as amended and provides uh, that the House insists on its amendment and requests a conference with the Senate. You heard the motion of the gentleman from Florida. Uh, is there any discussion yeah, or any amendments? Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Dreyer. I, uh, I am going to uh, urge a, a, a no vote on this rule. You know, once again, this is a, a very heavy-handed tactic, and what I'd like to do is I would like to offer an amendment, as I did on the last bill, that would simply say that, uh, let's see, I've got the amendment around for some place, the, uh, that um, upon adoption of this resolution, H.R. 2642, the Fiscal Year 08 Military Construction and Veterans Affairs Appropriations Bill, and H.R. 2638, 
the uh, Homeland Security Appropriations Bill and their accompanying papers are laid on the table. You've heard the uh, motion. Do I need to go through an, uh, oh, an explanation? Oh, if you'd like, no, if you'd like to, no, no, you can. I just, I'm I mean, happy I, to. Again, this is once again an opportunity. I always like listening to you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, once again, <laughs> we're providing the majority with an opportunity to just deal with what is a little more than a housekeeping matter from, right. from my point of view. I can't for the life of me understand why it is that uh, any member of the House would want to leave uh, the core of the shell of two bills that have already become public law sitting at the uh, at the desk. Uh, so I, I would urge my colleagues to support this amendment. We have different housekeepers, I guess. Uh, I guess so. Right. Um, you've heard the gentleman's uh, amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no, no. Aye. And the opinion of the chair that knows how it, the clerk will call the roll. Mr. McGovern. No. Mr. Hastings of Florida. No. Ms. Matsui. No. Mr. Cardozo. <laughs> Mr. Welch. No. Ms. Castor. No. Mr. Arcuri. No. Ms. Sutton. No. Mr. Dreyer. Aye. Mr. Diaz Villard. Yes. Mr. Hastings of Washington. Mr. Sessions. Aye. Madam Chair. Clerk will report the total. Four yeas, seven nays. Motion is not agreed to. Are there further amendments? Uh, Mr. 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 Hastings of Washington. I didn't have any witnesses. I didn't have any witnesses as to why we're using this procedure. But I find it rather interesting. The House passed their version of the budget on March 13th. The Senate passed their version of the budget on March 14th. The budget was supposed to be four houses, both houses, on or before April 15th. Today is May the 13th. Mm -hmm. My question, I guess, I guess I can only address it to you since we have no witnesses. Why are we using this procedure here that essentially, among other things, blocks minority from having uh, any say? Why didn't we go to Congress? Well, I think we're trying to move things along, and I think we're doing better than you did when you were in charge in terms of coming up with a budget resolution. Uh, we'll get a budget resolution. Once again, I would say, yeah. I always give us something by which we can measure your success. And one way, of course, measuring our success would be how open you promised you're going to be and you haven't been. And this is another example. Here we are, uh, one month after the time, and we're just now going to Congress. <laughs> And we're doing it in a, in a way that is highly unusual. So I, I just find that procedure rather interesting. But it seems to be a pattern. And uh, we'll, I guess we'll probably see more of this as we go in the future. But I thank the gentleman for his uh, candid, uh, uh, candid response. I try to be as open as I can. Any other, any other, uh, any other discussion? Um, be, yeah. Uh, we, yeah, so now that the vote occurs on the motion from the gentleman from Florida. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say no. No. In the opinion of the chair, we the ayes have, have it, and the clerk will call the roll. Mr. McGovern. Uh, aye. Mr. Hastings of Florida. Aye. Ms. Matsui. Aye. Mr. Cardozo. Mr. Welch. Aye. Ms. Castor. Aye. Mr. Arcuri. Aye. Ms. Sutton. Aye. Mr. Dreyer. No. Mr. diaz No. Mr. Hastings of Washington. No. Mr. Sessions. No. Madam Chair. Clerk, report the total. Seven yeas, four nays. The motion is agreed to, and um, I will carry it for us. And once uh, again, <laughs> the uh, distinguished gentleman from Pasco, Washington, will handle for the Republicans. I'm looking forward to it. The Rules Committee stands adjourned. Are you ready? West Virginia primary results in, the latest delegate count shows Senator Barack Obama still has the lead in pledged delegates. 2,025 are needed to secure the nomination. Looking at the schedule,